Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, obviously, I wish to thank you, the organizers, because this is a very nice opportunity for me uh, to, to join uh, uh, this, uh, this course and to present something that is uh, somehow parallel to the topics uh, uh, we, are, uh, we will uh, hear uh, during the week. Uh, I will talk about uh, machine learning and neural network applications, and uh, I will introduce these topics, but I will focus mainly on artificial neural networks, because they are probably uh, the most uh, uh, useful, simple, ready-to-use tools you can, uh, you can find. And there are some close relationships to other methods you will uh, discover and you will uh, uh, learn during this week. Uh, what is machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, how they uh, relate to other uh, disciplines in, uh, in uh, similar areas? Uh, well, in this, uh, in this scheme, you can see that uh, basically we have data somewhere, and we have uh, sciences that deal with the extraction of knowledge and the uh, discovery of knowledge in a uh, uh, large data set. But different approaches are possible, and statistics is probably the, the most popular, the most widespread. Uh, somehow, uh, when you need to recognize patterns, uh, you are mm, partly dealing with statistics and partly dealing with something else. And something else is in the field of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, it is uh, mm, not uh, something that everyone agrees uh, upon, but uh, usually machine learning is considered as a kind of subset of artificial intelligence that is a broader uh, field. A broader field because uh, it also deals with something that is not related to computational issues, that is related with cognitive or philosophy, whatever you can think about intelligence and uh, the way we interact with the uh, with machine. If we uh, look at computational issues only, then we are dealing with machine learning. And artificial neural networks are part of this, uh, of this latter group. So it, they are both tools useful for artificial intelligence, and they were developed as tools for understanding intelligence, but then they became something that is closely related to machine learning, so solving problems. All the, uh, all the activities we can carry out using data are, in, as a whole, are something we can call data science, while computer science involves also the way we manage data. That is a broader context. Okay. As for the relationship between uh, statistic and machine learning, in the, in, in the slide uh, we just saw, there was no overlap between the two. But actually, uh, the relationship are a, li a little bit more complex. Leo Breiman was a statistician and a machine learning specialist. Uh, he was uh, convinced that statistics deals with data modeling, and machine learning is something that deals with algorithmic modeling. Statistics focus on data, properties on data, things that we can do with data. Machine learning deals with the, the way we can use data, process data, and the way we can uh, exploit algorithms to solve problems. Uh, the uh, situation we are facing is that the, the amount of data 
uh, we have to deal with every day is increasing very rapidly. And uh, the knowledge we have to deal with this data is also increasing, but not as fast as the data amount. So the real problem is that our expectations are increasing much faster. And everyone thinks that we have a solution, a uh, reason, uh, a, good, uh, a good idea about just about everything. And this, is, of course, is not true. It's not possible because our knowledge is limited. So we have a difference that is increasing, increasing. And uh, in order to, to bridge this gap, we need some help. And this help can be provided by machine learning and artificial intelligence. Mm, let's think about these two definitions as more or less the same thing, more or less. OK, what is machine learning and what are the main technique uh, in this field? Uh, the real list of techniques is much longer. So what you see here, are just a few uh, main types of technique. Classification and regression trees, I mean binary or not even binary uh, trees with multiple split. Uh, if there are taxonom taxonomists among you, when you uh, need to identify a species, you have a key and you have to, to answer a number of questions sequentially. And this is exactly what a classification tree does. Artificial neural network is uh, what we will be discussing today. Support vector machine, genetic algorithms, case-based reasoning are other techniques. Uh, uh, if you are curious about them, uh, I think we will have the opportunity to discuss after this talk, maybe uh, this evening. So I will be very happy to answer all your, all of your questions. But we have limited time, so we must focus on uh, our topic. I want to mention, uh, however, the ensemble methods, among which random forests are probably the most popular and the most useful, because they are probably now the most useful algorithm we can use for classification uh, tasks. I'm not saying the best algorithm, because there is a, a nice uh, uh, point of view that I will mention later on about what is the best algorithm. Uh, random forests are basically a combination of classification trees. So we accept the idea that uh, if uh, we can develop something that learns more or less good enough, but not really very well. Uh, and then we can combine a, a large number of these weak <laughs> learners. Then the combination of the weak learners will be much more effective than the individual learners. So 100 classification trees are able to provide much better prediction classification than a single classification than the very best you can train. Uh, and there are other methods that are not based only on, uh, let's say, averaging the uh, result of a single method. So other methods are based on a kind of sequential processing. You develop a first model, and then you get some residuals between uh, your prediction and the true uh, result, your targets. And then you develop a second models that try to narrow the gap between what you predict and, the, and the, the true data, and so on. But even in this case, I will be happy to uh, answer all the questions after our uh, talk. So let's focus on artificial neural network. Uh, what is a neural network? Mm, I guess that mm, you probably already uh, so something like this, or maybe just l read something about neural networks from a newspaper, a scientific review, in, uh, even in some scientific papers. But basically, a neural network is uh, 
a set of very simple processing units. Uh, and uh, these processing units are connected with each other in a very complex way. And this is what makes a neural network a powerful tool. Uh, what is the history of neural network? Well, the, the concept uh, is very old, more than a century. Because the idea of the way the human brain is able to learn is something that dates back to the last decades of the uh, 19th century. But uh, more or less uh, during the Second World War and after that, uh, the first practical implementation uh, was uh, uh, obtained. I mean practical implementation of a theoretical idea. So it was something that was not really able to, to tackle a uh, real problem. Something that was just kind of concept uh, demonstration. Not mo more than, than that. But uh, the first rules for functioning of artificial neural networks, the first kind of very, very, very simple neural network date back to the 60s. Uh, but something happened uh, during the 60s, and two very influential authors, uh, they showed that these mm, perceptrons, these very simple <laughs> architectures of neural network, uh, had limitations. They were not able, with the knowledge of that time, to solve practical problems. And the consequence was that during the 70s, uh, most people abandon the uh, study of neural networks. In the 80s, there was a new start. And it was not exactly a fresh start. Because uh, under the ashes, there was still some activity. So uh, there was a new start uh, based on previous knowledge. Uh, Theo Koonen uh, first, first published a uh, work about a uh, paper about uh, self-organizing maps, and we will discuss about self-organizing maps today. In '82 and in '86, uh, Rumelart and his co-worker published a paper about uh, the error back propagation algorithm that was finally able to. Uh, make a neural network work, solve problems. And that was the start of a new era in uh, neural network applications. Uh, in 1991, uh, Colasanti, that was not an ecologist, uh, wrote in a paper that uh, he was sure that it, uh, there will be ecological application of neural network. And I guess that. No ecologist read that paper. But in the mid-19s, uh, the first ecological application, I would say the first biological application, or the first application in old field of neural network, uh, appeared. And since then, uh, the number of applications is constantly increasing. The next uh, uh, milestone I want to mention is in 2006 when deep learning appeared. Deep learning is something related to uh, more, I would say, different learning algorithms able to train much more complex structure that uh, mimic the functioning of, of human brain more closely than the neural network that almost everyone is using now. So this is our future, but it's something that already uh, exists. OK, uh, of course, there is a close analogy between nervous systems and artificial neural networks. Uh, th what makes them uh, similar to each other is that both are uh, comprised of many units. And these units are connected in a very complex way. But uh, if we think about the most complex neural network 
that we uh, have at the time of our talk, uh, the most complex neural network is probably less complex than the, the nervous system of a fly. So there is still much, 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 much work to do. OK, the kind of problems we can uh, tackle with neural networks, most common is for function approximation, let's say of empirical modeling. If you can do something using uh, general linear model or something like that, you can do probably better with a neural network. Pattern recognition, classification, clustering, forecasting. I mean, classification, it's more or less like pattern recognition in, from my viewpoint. Uh, here you know who, the categories you want to recognize. You, are, you don't know whether there are different categories or not in your, uh, in your data. Forecasting, just another way of, uh, of modeling, and so on. Uh, the learning procedure can be supervised. If you already have the answers you are expecting from a neural network, you can teach neural network, the neural network the right uh, answers. Unsupervised is when you want to discover the structure in your data. And based on reinforcements is something that uh, is more useful in, uh, I mean, in uh, industrial application. Uh, is something that deals with, uh, let's say, you know the Google car that drives by itself. It, that is probably a good example of reinforcement learning because the car learns uh, to get the, the highest reward uh, on the, from the possible choices. Uh, if we focus on uh, the most popular, the most typical applications, uh, pattern recognition is uh, something that deals with groups of uh, different uh, uh, objects, observation, samples. And you want to, uh, for instance, to uh, define the species of an individual, of a specimen. You want to detect the species, or you want to detect uh, some other property of, uh, uh, of your data. Clustering. Uh, is when you want to find the best way to separate homogeneous group and obtain homogeneous subsets of a larger set of observation. And this can be done in unsupervised uh, way. Here we don't have the right answer. For pattern recognition, we must have the right answers, and we have to teach to the neural network how to recognize our object uh, in a proper way. Another category is uh, regression. You know uh, the values for one, two, or many independent val variables, and you want to get estimates for one or many dependent ones. You want to, to fit a series of data and extract a more general way to, to relate this, these variables. And then, uh, this is also a supervised uh, uh, way of learning, but the search for an optimal behavior is based on reinforcement, as I was uh, uh, just saying. OK, I will skip uh, my own application, because I think it's, it's not really relevant, and we are running out of time. It was just an, uh, to have to get you a broader idea. But let's see uh, how a neural network is uh, designed. This is a three-layer perceptron, so a multi-layer perceptron, and this is three-layered. Uh, we have some nodes or neurons that are the input nodes. Here we uh, add, we, we put the the values for the variables that we use as predictors for others. Uh, usually, the data are scaled into a 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1 interval, because we want to normalize our data. Uh, the output is uh, 
the rightmost uh, node that uh, outputs a normalized value that must be uh, converted back to the original units, if you want. Uh, here, in, uh, in the middle, we have a number of uh, connections, of synaptic connections, and each connection is associated to a weight. There are two in this case, because we have three layers, and so we have n minus 1 biased nodes. These nodes work as the intercept in a regression. So it's, it's something that we only need to move up and down the, up, the output of the, of the network. OK, now let's have a look, a closer look at the so-called hidden layer, what is between input and output. Uh, the hidden layer is something that uh, contains nodes, neurons, that uh, collect all the inputs, sum all the inputs, and use this sum as the argument for an activation function that turns this linear combination of inputs into the output of the node, okay? So into the response of the node. And actually, this combination of linear combination of inputs and nonlinear transformation is what makes a neural network work. Uh, the activation function is usually uh, a sigmoid function like this. This is not the only way you can use a, a, an activation function. There are others. And in some cases, uh, the output uh, unit as a linear activation function just makes a linear transformation. Uh, what has been uh, demonstrated is that if you have a neural network like this, provided that the number of nodes in the hidden layer is large enough, and provided that you have enough data to train the network, then you can approximate every function to the accuracy level uh, you desire. Uh, it was proved in 1989, but then in 1991 it was proved that this, uh, this property was not related to the activation, activation functions, but on the three-layered structure. So it was the hidden layer, uh, the root for this property, provided that the hidden layer had a nonlinear activation function. OK, how uh, does the, a neural network like this learn? Uh, we pass to the neural network examples, and we know the, the, the answers. And our goal is to uh, make the artificial neural network learn, but learn to generalize, not learn by heart. And this is the most uh, relevant problem. And we will discuss it. This is in a minute. Testing uh, data. So data, a data set that is used only to test whether the neural network works properly is always needed. And this is something we should use independently of the method we are dealing with if we want to compare different methods in order to avoid circular uh, references. I won't uh, go into the detail of the back propagation algorithms uh, because we don't have enough time. Uh, but basically, uh, we uh, initialize the, the weights randomly or almost randomly. Uh, I mean, almost randomly, uh, it means that we can narrow the random range of the values. Uh, then we pass a pattern to the neural network uh, using these random weights, and we obtain an output value. Then we compare the output value with the known target value. And on the basis of the difference between the two, this is in red, and on the basis of the derivative of the uh, improvement, in learning, in the, in the output, we can 
define how large must be the change of the weight that we can uh, use, and so on. Uh, when the error is uh, small enough, we can exit the, the procedure. This is in theory. In practice, this is what happens. Imagine you have independent variable elevation and dependent variable species richness, very simple model. One input, one output, only two neurons in the middle. Uh, bias nodes are not shown here. Let's start uh, the training. Oh, it makes a jump. But we can probably st start over. But you can see that red line is the, is the output. No, I want to go back. OK. No. <laughs> OK, now it works. This is the output of one of the hidden nodes. This is the blue is the output of the other hidden node. And the red is the output of the network. Uh, as you can see, the weights that connect the hidden layer to the output are negative. And in fact, the shape of the curve is reversed. Uh, but basically, you can see that the longer you train, the better the red curve fits the data. This is a very simple example. It's, it seems that everything works very, very nicely. But there are problems. Uh, there are problems because in order to get the best weight, we have to look for a minimum in the error surface. So in, the, in, in a surface that uh, uh, is the relationship between an error measurement, let's say mean squared error, and the weights, this is only a line. But you can imagine that in two dimensions, this is a surface. In more dimensions, this is a hypersurface. But the problem is always the same. You have to start with a random guess. And you can uh, uh, find yourself in, in a local minimum. This is not going to work. So you have to try again. And you can be a little bit more lucky. This is a better solution, but still not the, the best one. So the training procedure needs some tricks to help the uh, network to learn. For instance, if you add some noise to the weights in the neural network uh, when the training stops, when you are st stuck in, in, to, in this point, if you add some noise, you are basically shaking your neural network, and the learning can start again. And if you're lucky enough, you can find the true minimum, the best solution. But it's not, uh, not so easy. This means that you, when you train a neural network, you always have to train again and again and again as long as you can. And you will find the best solution if you have enough time and computational power. During the training procedure, uh, if you look at the error uh, relative to the training set, to the data you pass to the network for teaching, then the error decreases steadily. The longer you train, the better you get. But if you look at the error in a validation set that is not passed to the neural network as an example, then this error will decrease and then will start increasing. Why? Because somewhere there is a minimum, but uh, up to this point, you are training a model. From this point on, you are training a memory, something that learns only the pattern you show them. Uh, imagine you have a, a, a person who is in a large library, can learn everything that is in that library, but that person is never being in the real world. The knowledge you can collect is probably uh, part of the, of, of, the, uh, of the knowledge you can get if he compares theory, examples, and real world validation. Okay, So we have to combine uh, 
these two uh, kind of information, and we have to stop the training when we optimize the learning relative to the validation set. There are some tricks that can help to uh, avoid this problem. For instance, imagine you have this kind of uh, bivariate problem, dependent, dependent, more or less like the same uh, we just saw, and we expect to train a model that uh, has this kind of, uh, of shape. But if we overfit the model, if we train too much the neural network, then what we obtain is like this. It's like using a very high degree polynomial. You can fit whatever you want, but it doesn't have a meaning. Okay. Uh, so what we can do? Uh, we can use uh, something that we call jittering. And so we add some noise to the data we have. So we use uh, not a single point, but we use a kind of uh, interval. And we fit those intervals. And fitting the intervals makes the response much more smoother and smarter than fitting the points. Uh, this is a practical consequence of overfitting. This is a typical problem, primary production at different levels of uh, phytoplankton biomass. And this surface shows the relationship between irradiance, uh, photic uh, zone depth, so kind of uh, transparency, and production. Uh, obviously, a shape like this is not likely to happen. You can't have two maxima in primary production for the same level of irradiance. There is no reason for that. It depends on transparency, but you cannot have two maxima, just one. Two maxima is not possible. You can have two minima in that curve, because you can have a the optimum for intermediate level of transparency doesn't make much sense, but in theory, it can happen. But for sure, you cannot have uh, surfaces like this. Too complex, no biological meaning in, uh, in them. So this is the, what happens when we overfit a neural network. OK, to avoid the overfitting, we discuss about early stopping to jittering, but we can for instance, pass the patterns for the training in random order. So the neural network does not learn the sequence of the examples you provided to it. Or we can use weight decay. Uh, this is a, a smart trick that uh, involves some steady uh, decrease of the, of the weight. So basically, it's like slowing down with your, with your car. It's, it's easier to drive the car if you slow down. And this is, makes the, the same trick with the, with the training. And the last, and from my point of view, the most interesting, is that you can add to the training procedure some penalties if the solution you obtain is not ecologically or biologically sound. If you see. If you, if you uh, recall the picture I just uh, show you, those su surfaces uh, uh, representing primary production as a function of irradiance and transparency, that surface must have only one maximum. There are no other possibility. So if you compute a partial derivative of that function, of that surface, and you apply a penalty to a network that does not comply with the shape you are expecting, you can drive the learning using a biological constraint. This is very interesting for uh, ecologists. Uh, in general, uh, uh, let the, the first point is somewhat how uh, trivial, but is important. So we don't want to uh, to have to deal with variables that are not at all in relationship, not even nonlinear relationship, with uh, our targets. If we have this kind of problem, there are other methods in machine learning that are not sensitive to non-relevant inputs. But neural networks are sensitive. Uh, if we want to model a continuous response, we want to process 
something that must be smooth, continuous, and we wanted a small change in input is a small change in output. And of course, we, have, we must have enough data. Enough data is, uh, is the main uh, thing we want for a, for a neural network, uh, in any case. Uh, so we need at least two sets of data, one for teaching the neural network, is a training that set, and one for validating during the teaching, during the training. Then, if we want to compare different models, or compare the neural, the neural network with other models, then we need the third set, the test set. Uh, but let's see how the computational uh, part of, uh, of what, what we are discussing work. This is a neural network similar to the one we, we saw in a previous slide. And imagine you have uh, 0 0.25 as an input value. What we do is just to, to compute uh, the linear combination from these two nodes to the green one. And the linear combination is 0 0.49. Uh, you can see here the computation we do. Of course, uh, this is 1 times 0 0.57. 1 is omitted here, obviously. And uh, in, so we pass the, this value to the activation function, and the output is 0, 0.62. And now we know that uh, this node has a 0, 0.62 output. And then we can do the same for, with this node and with the output node, and the overall result is 0, 0.55. So our function turns input value 0, 0.25 into output value. 0.55. Computations are very simple. And you can uh, write 10 or 12 lines of code to run your neural network once the weight of the network have been uh, defined, of course. So this is very, it's very easy to run a train. The network is a little bit more complex, but not too much complex, to, uh, uh, to define this weight. Uh, this part is only for uh, normalizing data before passing the data to a neural network. So it's computationally, it's very simple. Uh, is the training algorithm uh, we use really critical? Uh, we just talk about error backpropagation, but there are other algorithms that work as well, or in some cases, better than error propagation. But the, the truth is that uh, with ecological applications that are not real-time applications, the, uh, tra the uh, training algorithm is not critical. So if we stick with error back propagation, we can get usually the best result we can hope to, to get from a neural network. There are other types of neural network. Uh, only the, the, the multilinear perceptor? No, there are many types. I want to mention very quickly the radial basic function networks that use uh, uh, intermediate units that are not uh, logistic in their activation function. They are, uh, have some uh, uh, other types of uh, bell-shaped uh, functions. And the difference is that uh, the activation depends on the distance between this each of these processing units and the input array of values. So it's something that recognizes a pattern and uh, activates only a few of these units, uh, depending on the dis their distance from the input pattern. Then the uh, second step is just like the multilayer perceptron. Uh, I just want to, to show you this, uh, this, uh, this slide. Uh, imagine you want to uh, find the way to separate two groups of uh, objects. This is a typ typical classification problem. A multilayer perceptron find this kind of boundary. A radial basic function network find this kind of boundary. Because it's uh, based on, on a number of small radial responses. So you can combine radial responses in a very complex way, but basically you can do that. 
uh, if you want to, uh, to, to deal with the time series, if you want to, to, to get forecasts, uh, then there are some recurrent architectures that feed some context neuron that are not input neurons, are something that uh, work as kind of memory of the previous states of the network. And this can improve the ability to predict in a time series. This is the so-called Elman network, and this is called Jordan network. The difference is that here, the context neurons are fed by the inner neurons, and in that case, they are fed from the output neurons. But the way they work is very, very similar. Uh, I want to show you just one example. Uh, my uh, experience with neural networks started in 1996 with this paper. It was just a comparison of a typical linear model for primary production in Chesapeake and Delaware Bay and two neural networks. Uh, this is a model that combines the data from the two bays. This is the neural network that combines the data from the two bays. This is a, a combination model that distinguishes between the bays. And this is the neural network that is able to distinguish between the bays. You see, there is an input node that has bay as an input. OK? This Delaware, Chesapeake. It's kind of switch between two different ways of functioning. And of course, there was a huge difference in accuracy. Uh, then there is a story about this, but we don't have uh, time. And I have to, to skip this one. Sorry, I was. There's a way to skip smarter than skipping actually the, the slides. But let's uh, talk for a minute about uh, how we can open the black box models uh, just by sensitivity analysis. There are several methods. I mentioned some of them. Uh, the easiest one is just to look at the, at the values of the weights. Larger weights means probably more relevant variables. Mm, it's not very, very effective. Uh, then uh, you can also try to, uh, to see how the neural network behaves if you take only one variable it makes that variable vary from the minimum to the maximum, from 0 to 1 with normalized data. Uh, I always use a different method, just perturbation of the, of the input patterns. And there are other methods based on partial derivatives of the response of the neural network. Uh, it's something that probably is not optimized, not, not yet. What you can obtain is a ranking of the importance of the of the variables, and you can try to figure out the, their role, but you are not able to figure out how they interact. So second order effects are out of your reach, and this is a serious limitation. Uh, of course, you can also uh, look for the, the amount of change in error that depends on the amount of perturbation you had. And in some cases, you will discover that small perturbation does not affect the error. Uh, you can think, but probably the network didn't learn. No. Uh, this is a good uh, proof that the network is able to generalize. Because if, if it doesn't respond to changes that are not relevant, you are probably uh, dealing with a, with a good solution, uh, more robust. Okay. The, the ecological problem is that. Uh, there are some parts of the space of our data where perturbation doesn't make sense. If I uh, do sensitivity analysis by perturbation, and if I'm dealing with elevation and temperature in uh, rivers, uh, does it make sense to perturbate an input value assuming that uh, at a very high elevation, the temperature is very high? No, because it is not possible. And it is not possible that the temperature is low if you are close to the mouth of the river. So from, 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 an, ecologist, from an ecology point of view, <coughs> perturbation of data must be smarter than uh, just adding or subtracting something. There is some work going on, and uh, 
a PhD student of mine is working on uh, these issues now, almost ready. OK, uh, a few minutes, 10 minutes, to talk very briefly about uh, another type of uh, neural network, the self-organizing maps. Uh, they are using uh, uh, unsupervised learning. In most cases, there are some types of uh, self-organizing maps that actually uh, do supervise the, the training. And uh, the SOM, uh, as the acronym is, uh, basically is a combination of units that have the same structure of the input data. That means that if you are dealing uh, with uh, a list of species, typical community data, then the structure of a unit in a self-organizing map is a list of species with the abundances. And uh, what you can have is uh, something that works like a clustering algorithm if you, if you use only a small number of units or something that resembles an ordination if you use a larger number of units. OK. Uh, if, you, if you think up about the color picker in any office uh, uh, software, uh, this is what uh, a self-organizing map does. So you try to put colors that are similar to each other close to each other. And this is what the self-organizing map do. OK, uh, how they do that? Imagine you have your list of species in N, or in this case in P samples, P observation, and N species. This is the map we want to train. We can use rectangular maps, hexagonal maps, smaller, larger, smaller clustering, larger ordination. Uh, hexagonal as a better topology, but rectangular is, is uh, uh, good as well. OK, let's imagine that we have this map, and each uh, this square is, uh, is, a, uh, is an array of value, like this one. We initialize with random values. Then we pick at random one of our samples, and we look at the unit of the map that most closely resemble that sample. Of course, it will be different, but we can find the, most clo the, the, the closest unit. Once we have defined the closest unit, we change the values of this unit that, again, are exactly a list of species in this case. We change those values in order to make that unit a little bit more similar to that sample. And we also change the units in a neighborhood. But we change the neighborhood less than the best matching unit. And we go on with this kind of training, on and on and on. As soon as we have a, a structure that doesn't change anymore, at that point, we put all the original observation, or our samples, we project these samples onto the network. Usually, this is done using Euclidean distances. In most R application, all the, the application I know use that distance. But it is possible to use any distance, OK, if you want. So break artists, OK, break artists. Uh, in order to, to project the units, we only have to find the minimum distance. This is the structure of the SOM unit. And that is the, sample, the, the structure of the sample we want to, to project. And we have just to, to find the best matching unit. Uh, this is a real application with a number of, uh, of samples. And the structure of, uh, of each unit is a, a list of species. In this case, each species has a probability of occurrence. And uh, I want to show you this example that is about uh, butterflies of the small island around Sardinia. You know the biogeography, the island, the mainland, all the, the theory. That's the, the, the idea. So we want to, to, to understand how the species are distributed in this case. We can train the, the self-organizing map, project the samples from the different island onto the map. And this is what we obtain in 
this unit, you see the real data, presence or absence, the, pr the values of the self-organizing map, continuous values or binarized values, and all, the, all of them are matching. So this is a very good representation of the Tavolara Island butterflies. What we can do with, uh, with this map? Number of things. Uh, for instance, we can explode the map, and we can pick each unit. Uh, this is just an example. And we can compute the distance between this unit and all the neighboring units. And we can use different gray uh, shades to represent this, uh, this distance. And the average distance is the shade of gray of this unit. Uh, then we can decide whether we want to keep all the intermediate units or discard them. And we can obtain a representation like this, where lighter shade of gray means regions of the map where all the units are more similar to each other, and darker shade kind of ridges that separate different areas of the map. Is this map related to the ordination technique uh, uh, we discussed this morning? Yes, of course. This is principal coordinate analysis based on Euclidean distances. And this is the self-organized map based on the same data, Euclidean distances. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the circles around the, the labels show say, Mad and Asi, Maddalena and Asinara, and uh, samples that are in the same unit or here in the same group. Look at this group of, of observation over there on the upper right corner. And then these are the lower, and so on. So you can see that uh, the structure is obviously the same. So why should we use self-organizing map if we can op obtain more or less the same result with a well-known and well-functioning uh, tool. Because we can do something more with self organized map. Oh, we can do more or less the same thing even with ordination techniques. But there are some advantages. We can, you will see tomorrow when we practice. For instance, I can represent the density or the probability of presence of a species over the map. OK? So Vanessa Atalanta is much abundant or frequent in this island, less abundant in, in those. But this is very easy. You can use some bubble plot on the coordination. It's the same, OK? But then you can also add some other variables on the map, because you can interpolate external values, external variables, and add them on the map. And you can discover something about what makes the species uh, behave in that way. This butterfly is typical of the higher part of the uh, Mediterranean vegetation. So it's not to the sea level, only from 100 meters uh, on. And this is the maximum elevation of the island, and that is the uh, frequency of that butterfly. So there is a close relationship between the two. But we can do many other things. Uh, I guess we will see tomorrow something more. But I want to use this last minute just to for some take home messages. Uh, Multilayer perception and self organizing map are very useful. They are not magic. You can tackle the same problem with other tools. But these tools allow some, let's say, some craftsmanship. You can change the way they work. You can adapt them to your problem. You can use them in very different ways. There is no one right way to use these, these tools. You have to, to do some experience. You have to adapt them to your needs. There are some R packages for almost every, everything you can do with artificial neural net, network. But the problem is that when you have big data, in the sense of large data set, then you will discover that, especially with neural networks, R can become a bit too slow. So if you want to, to, de, to do some real work with your neural vector, you will end up writing, compiling, 
your own code. And even if you want to, to implement some of the methods we just dis discussed here, and there are many others. So R is a good uh, environment for the, for the main types, for standard runs, for experimenting, just to get started. Okay? It's up for 99% of the people, it's, it's good enough. If you want to do some real work, then you need something else. Uh, probably uh, most of you were not familiar with uh, this kind of tool. Now we are a little bit more familiar, and tomorrow I hope we, you will have the possibility to get started tomorrow or next month if you want. Uh, what you cannot uh, learn quickly is to add some uh, ecological thinking uh, because you must always be first ecologist, then modeler or data scientist. Uh, if, you, uh, if you ever worked with, a, with someone that was not an ecologist, very good at uh, dealing with numbers, with, uh, with algorithms, but that with no ecological knowledge, then you are losing something. Some time is necessary because you, you need technical skills. You have to, to, to ask someone for advice, for instance. But ecological thinking is the basis for good results and for sound results, especially. Uh, remember that uh, if you uh, fall in love with a method, with a theory, with, a, with an hypothesis, and this is very easy, then you're probably out of business because that is not the, the, the right way to do. But everyone fails, me for sure. Uh, there are no such thing like too many data. Uh, it's always a, a good thing to have too many data. Uh, too many variables hmm, depends on the methods, but we can use that. When we have not enough data, not enough record, then we are really in trouble. Uh, do we have two more minutes for the last slide? I can jump, because you see that uh, small triangle there. If I click there, I jump to the thank you. <laughs> I have one more slide. But I want to, to show you something that is uh, a, good, uh, a good synthesis of what uh, me or everyone who worked with this kind of uh, problem uh, will learn. And this is partly by Leo Breiman and partly by these two other authors. Uh, Rashomon. If you remember the, the movie that was based on the of four person who was uh, telling the same fact from their own point of view. One of them was not, not, not a person, but was uh, someone who was dead. It was talking uh, through uh, a medium. Okay, But basically, there is no objective truth. So there is never the best, the most adequate method, algorithms. It depends on the way you define your problem. It depends on the constraint. Uh, a second uh, viewpoint that is a consequence of the first is the no free lunch or no free meal, as you prefer, theorem. And this was demonstrated. Uh, so if you take two optimization algorithms and you test them over a wide range of different methods and uh, situations, you will never find the best. So there will always be set up where one of them will be better than the other. So no best method at all. Uh, the Occam razor, you know that. But when we deal with machine learning, is the problem is simpler is better. No, because simpler can't adapt to complex problems, cannot represent complex behaviors. But complex is very difficult to train. And complex can turn to uh, learning by, by, by heart, turn learning to memory. 
And this is not what we, what we want. So mm, it's not always true that simpler is better. Ensemble method, those based on the using a number of algorithms and then averaging, for instance, they, their results, is a typical case. It's much more complex, but it actually works better if properly trained. The last point is the so-called uh, problem of the high dimensionality of our data. Uh, the curse of dimensionality is a problem related to the fact that we, if we have a neural network with, let's say, 100 weights, we can't train that network unless we have thousands of records. We can't hope to, to train a network so complex with a handful of uh, records. But if we use proper approaches, then we probably can take profit of the, the, the higher dimensionality of our data. Many variables, a lot of opportunity to, to use them in a different way, to find uh, one of the models that performs uh, not the best, but the best we can afford with our data and our knowledge. Uh, tomorrow, we will practice a few of the things we, we discussed today. And I hope that uh, seeing what happens will help you to uh, understand how useful these methods uh, can do. They can't substitute, they can't uh, replace good statistics, good ecological thinking, or something else. So it's another tool in your toolbox. Thank you very much. And uh, if you uh, plan to uh, practice tomorrow at this address, you can find scripts and data we will be using. And these are the uh, R package you have to download and install. And these are some of the programs I'm using. Uh, there are no explanation, no how manuals, but I will talk 10 minutes tomorrow about them. And in case uh, you want to try something that is not only R, for instance, for large data set, I would be happy to share them with you, not only the programs, but also to provide you the direction for using them uh, effectively. Okay, so it's an alternate solution, not the best one. Okay, thank you very much.